This video is brought to you in partnership with Novartis. You and I have no problem perceiving human life-sized objects with that tiny slice of the electromagnetic spectrum that you and I call visible light. But is it possible to use that same light to see objects that are so small they're not even microscopic? Let's get technical. <laughs> When we fantasize about fantastical interactions between photons of light and our eyeballs, we usually turn to superheroes and superpowers instead of to technology. We daydream about heat vision and x-ray vision, which you still definitely don't want, and seeing the universe at the very smallest scales. Peeping the tiniest parts of the universe with visible light in particular seems impossible. There are no run-of-the-mill microscopes that can see anything smaller than about two-tenths of a micrometer. This is a physics-based limit. But then just a few years ago, separately in 2000 and 2006, three scientists came up with a way to let us see past this limit, to let us see like superheroes. <laughs> Before we get to this incredible innovation, first, how does a microscope like this actually work? I threw that like 10 kilometers, by the way. I have a bunch of superpowers, so into the sun with you. <laughs> Well, if you remember our episode about Ant-Man, a compound microscope, which has multiple lenses along a common axis, kind of works like a magnifying glass. In this case, you place some object that you want to enlarge in your eye at one end of the microscope, and then you hit it with some visible light. That light bounces off of that object and then is bent through the first lens towards the second or however many are in there. When the light finally reaches your eye after going through the last lens of the microscope, you can see that it has been bent in such a way that your brain actually interprets it as though there is something much larger on the other end of your microscope. Our best optical microscopes that work in this way can magnify images tens, hundreds, even over a thousand times, but no more than this. And that's because in this specific case, light has a very specific limit. But not me though, because Boyd Cannon is changing all the time and I write it and no one can tell me nothing about it. Seeing the small with visible light is limited because of light's weird waviness. You've probably heard that light, oddly enough, acts as both a particle and a wave. So just for a second, imagine some waves of light coming off of my face and moving towards this opening here. Now, just like waves of water would bend out and around from hitting some obstacle like a rock in the water, this wave of light is going to diffract out from this opening. When these diffracted light waves come out of this opening, they're gonna look a bit different. Light waves can constructively and destructively interfere, and it can make it look as though the single source of light is no longer a single discrete point. And now if we let these waves of light continue on and hit something like a wall, and we measure the intensity of the light at every point on this wall, we can draw a curve that looks something like this, showing the relative intensities. You can see that most of the light, as it constructively and destructively interferes, is in the center of this intensity curve, and it trails off at the edges. The light doesn't look like a single thing anymore, but you know it's still a single thing. So what if you add another source of light? As you can see here, if we had two sources of light, maybe like two flashlights, if they got close enough together, you might start to lose track of which one is which. And this is actually the limit for our optical microscopes. And we've known about this limit for almost 150 years. Wow, I'm not throwing this hard enough. Hit! All the way back in 1873, a German physicist named Ernst Abba was looking into these ripples of light and just how good an optical microscope could possibly be. If two sources of light were relatively large and far apart, you would have no trouble determining, even in a microscope, which object was which. However, if the two sources of light are really, really tiny and really close together, a microscope might not be able to fundamentally tell the difference. More specifically, if two tiny sources of light are so close together that they're closer than about half the wavelength of the light that is coming from them, then they will be unresolvable as two objects. 
This limit came to be known as the ABBA limit, and while it meant that our best optical microscopes could see all the way down to 200 nanometers and peep tiny boys like bacteria and mitochondria, it meant that we wouldn't be able to use visible light to go all the way down to the level of proteins and even individual molecules. But our scientists kept at it, and just under two centuries later, we actually surpassed this hard limit, because that's what science heroes do. Thanks to some real brainiacs, our best optical microscopes can now see single molecules. Let's say that we are scientists and we have some small section of tissue we want to explore on the smallest scales. But because of the diffraction limit again, we cannot use our microscopes to resolve individual elements of what's going on here. So what do we do? Well, we let nature reveal itself. Instead of trying to resolve whatever is in this little cube of tissue and have it be a blur, what if we as clever scientists tried to see individual molecules one at a time? What if we put maybe fluorescent markers on these molecules that responded with a little glow to laser light? Then over time and over many laser pulses, we can reveal individual molecules over time and start taking snapshots of them to locate them in X, Y, and Z coordinates. If we replicate this process many times and put all of our little laser pictures together into one image with the help of computers, we get what looks like kind of a pointillist painting, but is in reality a nanoscopic portrait. This is a picture of the proteins that give your cell shape. The technique that we're describing here goes by a few different names depending on the specific method being used, but we can generally call it nanoscopy, or nanoscopy, if you want to sound way more fun. 150 years after the ABBA limit was theorized, in 2014, three scientists came up with two different nanoimaging methods and won the Nobel Prize. The first method, called single molecule microscopy, is what we just described. The second method is very similar, but instead of using a laser to excite individual molecules and take a number of pictures and assemble that into one big three-dimensional image, stimulated emission depletion microscopy instead uses two different lasers, one to excite molecules and one to de-excite molecules, and then create an image nanometer by nanometer. Either way, we can now resolve images in our microscopes that are in the tens of nanometers range, 10 times better than anything a 19th century scientist could have predicted. Yeah! Oh. Nanoscopy is incredibly clever, but I might be making it sound too easy. This scientific superpower takes a lot of very smart people and a lot of hard work. I've partnered with Novartis, a global pharmaceutical company, for this video because their scientists and associated researchers are using nanoscopy right now and are using it like, dare I say, actual superheroes. Novartis is already creating some mind-blowing science using these techniques. Here you can see a time-lapse video of individual proteins moving through a single rat neuron. And in this, you can see a real three-dimensional rendering of the complex nanoscale biology happening inside of a single cell. The end result of blinking lasers illuminating individual molecules. These images can be terabytes worth of data assembled by humans aided by computing power and machine learning. Without nanoscopy and these kinds of techniques, this is a world that we would never have seen with such clarity. Wow, I am bad at throwing stuff, but let's go back to our first nanoscale image for a second. What Novartis is doing, creating videos and time lapses of the nanoscale world, isn't just for fun. What you're seeing here, the stuff in green moving around this neuron, is called tau protein. It helps stabilize the structure of a brain cell. And what you're seeing here in pink is also tau protein, except it's misshapen and tends to clump in a way that we most often associate with Alzheimer's disease. These disruptive clumps of tau proteins can build up so much that it starts to damage and destroy the neurons that it's clumping in. If you had a healthy neuron here, this neuron is literally falling apart. And when neurons, your brain cells start falling apart, so too do your memories and your personality and everything that makes you, you. 
We know that tau protein accumulation has something to do with the progression of Alzheimer's disease, and so now Novartis and others are using nanoimaging techniques like this to follow the disease at the protein level from the very start at the very smallest scales. And we are making progress. We now have three-dimensional movies of tau proteins accumulating inside of actual cells. If doctors and scientists are lucky, this kind of technique could lead to a potential potential treatment, or at least a pathway to treatment. And one day, after years of careful research, we might actually save lives with this, or at least make them better. Of course, nanoscopy is just a single tool, and there are no real silver bullets in medicine. But because so much of the mechanics of life are built in the universe of the small, nanoscopy and associated methods have the real potential to help people. And at the very least, we're going to learn something. And from all this serious science, we could probably speculate about the pop culture element to this too, how all those see everything superpowers might work. Maybe with complete control over the electromagnetic spectrum and the radiation flying out of her pupils, a superhero could excite certain atoms and molecules and then interpret the reflected light in her brain and collate it into a three-dimensional image that would resemble something like nanoscopy that we would get. Or it could be space magic. But I, I never prefer magic. So that's how, through the sheer power of science and human ingenuity, we overcame a light limit for optical microscopes that we thought impassable just a century ago. The microscopic and nanoscopic superpowers in comic books have come true. The techniques that Novartis and others are using in research right now have the potential to help a great many people. But even if we don't find a new cure or treatment for some terrible disease like Alzheimer's, at the very least, we will have proven once again that science is our best tool for clearing up the blurriness of life. Because science, these are, n these are not real. We were talking about optical microscopes today and how we've broken light limits and seen down to the smallest scales, and it's all amazing, and what Novartis is doing is incredible. But I should point out that we do have microscopes that can see even smaller stuff than this, something like an electron microscope. Because the wavelength of an electron is even smaller than small wavelengths of light, I think the magnification that an electron microscope can get to is like, not 2,000 times, but 10 million times. And when you can see something that small, you, you're, are you even practicing nanoscopy anymore? Electroscopy? Yotoscopy? Small vision? Eh? Thanks again to Novartis for collaborating with me on this video. Novartis uses science-based innovation to address some of society's most challenging healthcare issues. They discover and develop breakthrough treatments and find new ways to deliver them to as many people as possible. Thank you so much for watching, Ashton. If you like this episode, you will probably like some of our other superhero and superpower episodes. I don't even know how many there are at this point, so just go and click one of them. And if you want to interact with me, give me ideas for the show, or interact with Because Science, please follow us at these social media handles here. Thank you. <laughs>